meeting. So welcome everybody. Um, I, it's a pleasure to have um, folks from uh, the GeoPost standard. Um, they uh, reached out to us when they saw that we were looking uh, for how to standardize um, our, the pose uh, representation in Elixir and they reached out to us and said, hmm, well, we have the standard and uh, why don't you all look into that? And I said, sure. And, uh, and so that's how uh, we are here. Um, and uh, several of us, the core people here are, um, have read, um, have gone through the standard and, um, uh, but you know, there are some new people as well. So the idea is uh, what I requested uh, you, Christine, was that you would present a little bit about, you know, give uh, people an overview of what the, uh, your consortium is about and, and get dive into technical details about what the standard is about, you know, what you would like um, Elixir uh, to do. And uh, we had a few questions specifically that we sent to you about whether you're OpenXR compliant, because that's like the starting point for us. So we are looking forward to hearing about that and uh, we will take it from there. Perfect. Um, so I, I do see that the file has left my, my, my side. So uh, we perhaps... don't have, I don't, I don't have it yet. So uh, I don't know if okay. any of your other, uh, the other folks from GeoPose who are here and perhaps you can also Rob? have a lot of introduction. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly Christine. what I will do. Yes. yes. I am here and I am ready to present the slide deck that okay. I shared oh, with great. you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So you, you will have it shortly. Um, sorry about that delay. And um, so thank you. I'll go ahead and introduce myself and get started. And then uh, it's great that Mikhail is here with us. So my name is Christine Pere. I have been uh, working in the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, participating in standards activity in that particular uh, standards development organization for about 10 years. But I've also participated in um, other standards bodies, such as uh, the IEEE and uh, ISO, W3C and others, um, the Kronos Group, for example. So I'm very familiar with the activities of the Kronos Group and the OpenXR, though I'm not a developer. Um, I am an advocate for standardization and I focus on interoperability for augmented reality. Um, about, I think, uh, three and a half years ago, um, we proposed to the OGC that there be uh, the development of a, a universal um, data, data format, interchange format for spatially anchored or earth anchored um, orientation and, and position. And this is um, what we have um, been working on. And then in uh, January of 2022, we presented it to the um, architecture board, that's one of the OGC's uh, committees, and they approved this for going forward as a standard, and it was voted by the uh, technical committee, which is all the members or all the voting members, in May of this year. We've been um, working in parallel, several people have been working in parallel on implementations. Um, that, of course, is the a very, very important test of any specification is um, how easy or how, um, how often and where can it be implemented? And that's really uh, a question that we answered in a document, a supplementary document we called the reviewer's guide, which has been sent out to you. And um, it's, a, it's a quite an extensive analysis of where geopose could be valuable, uh, what are the use cases, and it provides some language, a glossary, which Mikkel, who's, who's here with us now, um, uh, he, he developed that uh, taking inputs from the standards working group members. We are about um, I think 25 members of which about half, I'd say 12 or 13 are very active. Um, we meet uh, weekly, except for we took a, a short break in the summer this year. And so we are actively uh, meeting 
and meeting with developers. We asked, uh, we invited, as you mentioned, you joined one of our meetings in the early summer. Um, we are having meetings with Hexagon, which is a very large geospatial company. Um, we've also been reviewed by um, the engineering teams at the um, at ESRI, which is another uh, geospatial industry leader. And um, now Magic Leap is joining our meetings to talk about their implementations. And there are several other um, hardware and software companies that are actively uh, working on it. And although we don't have uh, commercial implementations today. One of those who's um, been working on an implementation is Mikhail, who's going to be presenting, as well as Rob Smith, who's also in this call. So they'll be able to answer some questions. In advance of this meeting, we asked ourselves, um, why would you include uh, GeoPose as a part of your, your platform. We also had done, as I mentioned in an email to you, Sarita, an analysis of what OpenXR, uh, how it expresses Pose. It, it does so um, it, to only a limited extent. It does not in, express Pose in the same, with the same number of um, attributes as GeoPose. And the other, it, the other thing that's different is that OpenXR requires a timestamp. We have support for that, but it's not a specific implementation. Um, so I think we'll, we'll uh, leave it at that for now and see if there are any questions. Before we get started with the presentation, is there, is there anything I have um, neglected to, to include? Yeah, on our side, we are good and looking forward to the presentation. Okay, yeah, all right, fantastic. So, so perhaps I see you Steve, can, um, yeah. Steve Smith has joined our call. Uh -huh. um, I'd like to introduce Steve. Um, Steve is our, uh, the architect who really um, designed the structure of the standard and uh, was also the editor of the standard. And he has, um, I'm just gonna summarize, because it would take too long to speak of all of his history. But Steve Smith um, has also been doing implementation and has studied the Elixir platform and OpenXR and will be able to answer any specific questions that, we ha that you have uh, from that perspective. Um, Steve, I wonder, have you been able to uh, see, can you see Welcome, Steve. <laughs> Can Hello, you see... sorry for being, being a little late. I was um, on a meeting that went over. Can you see um, Mikkel's screen? Mikkel is presenting some slides yes. that... Um, so Mikkel, do you want to present? Uh, would you like to go ahead and, and um, uh, go over these slides for about uh, the next 10 minutes? Or do you want Steve yes. to do that? Uh, it's no problem for me to express it. It's just that Steve might offer a more um, graphical, I mean, a geospatial uh, vision from this because I am a computer graphic uh, expert, let's say, uh, and there is like this um, vision that we are trying to agree on of how to represent information. But otherwise, we are uh, working on the same issue. And yes. I will say that uh, if I can move, yeah. And what is the vision behind the OEC GeoPose or GeoPose uh, for short? It's like the, right now, there are too many uh, incompatible ways to define the position uh, and orientation of a spatial elements in a geogra geographical ellipsoidal uh, coordinate system. Basically, the ellipsoidal nature of the Earth um, generates like different uh, problems when you are trying to define a position and especially an orientation because some people use heading, other people uh, think uh, with different reference frames. Uh, there are different ways to define the orientation relative to the uh, vertical axis, but not uh, in any other axis. So uh, it results in many uh, incompatible incompatibilities and basically it is difficult to share information. So uh, the goal of this um, standardization group is to create a system that enables uh, everybody to exchange post information, the position and orientation 
of um, both real and virtual objects uh, from a geographical point of view, uh, even if um, we use uh, different uh, local frames of reference. So it's, uh, like it's not just uh, longitude and latitude, but there are many other ways to define it. Uh, so how can we deal with this issue? And that is uh, how we are trying to um, define the location and orientation of digital or real objects, including uh, virtual scenes in extended reality. Uh, and well, uh, at the end of the day, we are um, trying to redefine part of what uh, we gra uh, graphic um, designers work with the um, frame transform chain, or basically the uh, scene graph. Uh, and the idea is how can we uh, allow the definition of uh, our outermost frame uh, relative to uh, what it is called an ephemeris object, uh, and in this case, the Earth, and be able to define uh, properly our fixes, fixed poles so that we can have a, from a topocentric reference frame a, a pose of any kind of object. So that uh, both if it is the uh, camera of a device, the position and orientation of a device, or the position and orientation of a um, virtual object, we have the same way to define it so that we can understand each other. Uh, and a geopose, in summary, a geopose ties the location and orientation of a spatial object to the Earth surface. Uh, there are uh, different uh, scopes that we have been looking at, uh, and the idea of having individual concrete data objects, like defining the specific properties for a JSON object uh, at the end, transform to it, so that we can specifically uh, define how to uh, describe the location, orientation, or position, or and rotation of uh, an object relative to the Earth uh, from uh, a Earth fixed geodetic spatial reference system. It's a mouthful. Uh, but uh, also, we have been dealing with uh, other problems associated to the needs of other people. It's not just a, a computer graphic artist or um, geospatial um, engineers, but there are many other um, applications that require geopose. So that, that that's why we have developed composite structures so that we can translate other elements uh, and recreate part of what we call the scene graph, the transform chain so that uh, we can create like um, orientations that take into consideration the curvature of the earth or, or any other geodetic calculations. These are transformed into link structures like chains or graphs. And that is why we have right now a core uh, composed of the basic uh, geo pitch roll uh, geopose, a basic quaternion, in case that you want to use one or the other, but uh, we also take into account time and sequences so that you can define animations or you can define all kinds of uh, advanced systems. But basically, uh, are these two uh, the definitions, the targets, the basic job pitch role and the basic quaternion. But uh, why uh, I believe uh, geopose is important from uh, extended reality, and in particular for uh, the Illinois uh, extended reality benchmark suite, uh, because uh, current apps uh, in XR are limited uh, because the very same model they are using. Uh, we have problems with uh, uh, app stores that are too crowded with uh, apps. So if you try to replicate that idea of creating an app store where you have to look uh, via keywords or you have to do an index, it's going to be very difficult for the users to find the right experience. Uh, and they have to wait uh, until it is downloaded and install it. Uh, and most of the time is not what they are looking for. Uh, and also the problem is that uh, with apps, we are thinking about limited spaces, what we usually refer to as a scenes that have a very a custom made widgets with very little interaction mechanism, uh, preventing the creation of meaningful workflows. So 
uh, whereas in normal PCs, we have the different applications in different screens and we can copy paste between them rather easily, or even we can uh, link between each other. Uh, in XR, the very model goes against that idea so that it, it cannot be used for actual work because you cannot combine this with just with, uh, with the other. Uh, fortunately, uh, with XR, there is another um, view that we can apply. There, there is new HCI, um, human computer interaction paradigm based not on apps, but on experiences that uh, use a space, the spatial nature of the world to be able to discover them because you can move around the world and then you can find those experiences, even if it's just a context, even if it's just a basic 3D model without interaction, you can find it just as you go down the street. Uh, and yeah, this is the concept of a discovery system based on the context of the user. Mostly it is the geographical position and orientation of the user uh, or the device that the user is wearing so that uh, you can discover new virtual objects or uh, load and unload contents as you go through the world. And this is where OGC GeoPost uh, gives the developers the ability to create this kind of uh, experiences and place them in the world uh, in a common way so that even if uh, there are um, any other uh, problems, at least you know that in that place there is an experience. And if you have uh, you are using another kind of framework or whatever it is, you at least know that it is there so that you can access it uh, by looking for other systems. But especially I believe that the idea of being able to collaborate, be, uh, create collaborative interaction spaces that uh, they cover the entire world and have a smaller interoperable widgets rather than uh, complex apps, uh, will allow us to combine things together and then uh, unlock the true potential of uh, XR as an interaction paradigm. But yeah, how this uh, GeoPose can be integrated within the Elixir uh, framework? Well, uh, I believe uh, after looking at the videos and um, slides that are uh, linked in your website, I believe it is relatively easy to integrate uh, OGC GeoPose because uh, at the end of the day is just a, an extra method for the post class that you already uh, have implemented uh, in the visual inertial odometry and IMU systems and it is just changing the um, coordinate system instead of using an Euclidean space with X, Y and Z um, um, access you have uh, to use a local tangent plane with coordinate, uh, coordinate system like the one you see here uh, LPT NU like east, north and up vectors uh, and from that you can actually um, create whatever you need for most use cases because while if you are working with large structures like bridges or railways that cover an entire area you have to uh, see which elements are beyond the horizon or you have to curve them for most use cases it's just uh, performing an additional matrix multiplication for every transform so that uh, before uh, sending it to the gpu you can obtain the position uh, relative uh, to the camera in um, a geodetic uh, matrix view so uh, it is uh, relatively easy and uh, the only problem that uh, I believe they might have is like now uh, integrating with different systems, it might be complicated, but otherwise uh, it can be uh, created just with a um, simple uh, matrix multiplication. Simple in terms that you have to create that uh, additional matrix, but it can be applied to multiple objects. But uh, yeah, that is the end of my presentation. And yeah, I believe there is a um, good way for uh, us to collaborate using this uh, new system that the GeoPost is defining. So when you say that it will be hard to integrate new systems, 
I'm confused because I thought this would actually make integrating new systems easier, right? Because you can go between different reference frames. So why would why do you think it would be harder? No, um, maybe I don't. Uh, I have not explained my answer, but the idea is that uh, you have a, a new reference frame, but uh, there might be uh, problems if other people use other frameworks, other languages. But at the very least. With these reference frames, you know that there are there is something there. So the uh, the special uh, positioning part, the uh, geopos can uh, help uh, to solve it. Uh, ah, I see that Christine Perry has said uh, is uh, her hand. Uh, do you have? Do you want to say something, Christine? Um, actually, <laughs> I, I'm uh, I'm unable to lower my hand, but I do want to see if. Uh, I do appreciate your asking for clarification, Hizaifa, and um, I wondered if Steve wanted to add anything from his perspective that um, that you've studied the OpenXR system already, and if you wanted to add any details, Steve. Uh, I think that the main uh, additional piece of information that comes along with GeoPose is the link to the geodetic reference systems. In other words, systems of describing location on the surface of the earth uh, that are uh, between which you can convert. Uh, if you look in detail, you have uh, the crustal plates on the surface of the Earth are moving a few centimeters a year. And there are coordinate systems and coordinate reference systems uh, that actually track the change in latitude and longitude and height of things that aren't moving as far as normal humans are concerned, but, but really are. And one of the characteristics of spatial information, at least in uh, 2022 is that uh, huge amounts are uh, in different coordinate reference systems. And if they're going to be integrated or even uh, <clears throat> discovered, uh, that they need to be brought into a common reference frame. So one, one of the big ideas of GeoPose is that the information necessary to bring um, spatial information into your reference frame, for example, a local tangent plane coordinate system, which is in a way the naive reference frame for humans <clears throat> just wandering around on the Earth's surface. Um, the, the data to do the transformation um, is, is present. So this um, aid to discovery and integration is the the main value add uh, from a big picture point of view for GeoPose. Yeah, I wanted to add that from my study of what I've read and looked at on the Elixir platform, it seems that it's very focused on the computation and the delivery, the um, presentation of graphical information in XR um, without, at this time, maybe because it's just hasn't been on your roadmap yet, any uh, or without consideration of the user's physical environment that might trigger those experiences. So um, the the fact that the um, planar objects like QR codes or, or a drawing or something in the world could trigger an experience is all well and good, but um, having information about the user's context in space on the planet is much richer way of producing experiences. And I believe that's what uh, Mikhail was pointing out. Yeah, uh, but also finding those uh, experiences. 
because I want to be able to create those experiences to be able to make XR platforms independent from PCs. But uh, the main focus is that uh, when I have my glasses, I want to be able to go el elsewhere and go to a restaurant and I will automatically have access to the menu of that restaurant, even if I am not even able to read which uh, the, the name of the restaurant because it's in another la language. So uh, in this way, uh, we solve the biggest issue regarding interaction. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we uh, enable communication through this uh, spatial dimension. So you can leave messages, annotations everywhere. You can um, find uh, information about uh, particular elements. So there is a, a lot of uh, interesting uh, interactions just in, in terms of what you can do with the space. And when, 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 I, when I mentioned integration, uh, it's even integration with things like uh, shadows. So in order to get the right shadows for now and the place you are, you need to be able to reference uh, the location of the sun or the moon. I see. So if there is some implementation that conforms to the GeoPose standard, um, then what that means is that, there, that implementation provides a function uh, which can transform the local frame of reference to this ephemeris object, which in GeoPose's case is the Earth. Yeah, by default. Okay. I, I wish that it, we can use it in other planets, but just yet it is a little bit difficult. Right. <laughs> okay. So if you have several different than GeoPose implementations and they all provide this function, then I'm assuming it's transitive. So you could go from your local frame to the ephemeris and then from the ephemeris to somebody else's local frame. Yes, that's the idea. So that uh, we can all agree, uh, even if we use different uh, local frames, then we can, like uh, you have an scene in one place of the world and another scene in another part of the world. And we can both agree on the position of a, a satellite between both scenes. So gotcha. in, in that sense, it's like uh, you can create connections between different uh, um, spaces, the different interaction spaces, even if those you are working in a Euclidean space because it's faster and easier, you can agree of where a satellite between the two of them is. Great. So yeah, so that you can understand some examples that we are using this for uh, in my company, we have like different uh, construction sites and we have like uh, trucks that are delivering objects. And since it, they are um, uh, very far apart, uh, the um, curvature of the earth makes it impossible to actually see where the truck is. But with this, we can at, at least create a virtual uh, arrow that points beyond the horizon to indicate where the truck is with uh, augmented reality. Like um, uh, how in video games, you will usually see like a, a cylinder of light, like a beacon of light, and then you just know where the object is. But if it is beyond the horizon, you have like a possibility to see it as even if it is uh, obstructed by the horizon itself. Right. And or obstructed so by anything obstructed by by anything it, it, it could be and and i i want to also make sure that we have a chance to have steve explain what he's doing with the street drone data set but it's not for right now when, when you have a chance certainly want to hear your questions so then to go back to the restaurant example how that would actually work is let's say the owner of the restaurant they have some device that they're wearing um, and that device implements the GeoPose standard. So then if they have some anchor, right? Like they put some virtual object, some virtual information um, somewhere in that restaurant. 
the idea is that that could then be converted into geopose, which is basically a global, as an absolute location. It's not relative anymore. And when somebody walks into that restaurant, they could basically query whatever information is available in that physical neighborhood. Yeah, is that that's, the the, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, but that will be just a 3D model that you will be able to see like if it is a menu, but uh, my goal is to make those experiences more meaningful so that it actually shows the menu it automatically translated to your language and then applies your um, allergies for example so uh, when we are uh, talking about discovery is being able to create a match between the uh, context of the user and the context of the object that uh, of the things that uh, you can see but uh, in this case, with geopose, it's just the spatial nature. So uh, you see that the discovery goes beyond a spatial context. But the standard itself is just about the spatial. Yeah, uh, just position and uh, orientation, location and orientation. So the idea is that you can query just by looking around what objects are around you. And then you can uh, just uh, download those elements. And when you leave the area, you uh, unload all the, uh, those contents so that you don't have to install and uninstall different uh, applications. It is uh, done automatically. If I take this task, yeah. uh, one, one way to think of this is <clears throat> that the spatial context for each of the the shops or things that you might interact with, each of these contexts is abstracted to a geopose. And so when you're doing searching to do discovery, you're searching through the geoposes rather than through geometry. Right. Yeah. 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 But you can, you don't have to associate geopose just with discovery, even if I believe it is the most interesting application of it, because mm -hmm. if you want to represent the path of a um, plane or you want to track the orbit of a satellite, you can still use Geopose for that. Right. So I'm still not, well, I should see if uh, Boyan, uh, you looked at this a fair bit. Do you have questions? Yeah, I guess my question is like uh, more seeing the high level, uh, high level area. But uh, but right now we're 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 talking about technical details, so we probably should finish this discussion first. It's okay. You can you can ask your question. I think I know what what it is. Yeah, Go yeah, ahead. sure. Yeah, so basically from your your review guide, I heard that uh, there are other uh, implementations like like DLTF from, from Kronos Group and USD from Pixar. And you said you're going to make GeoPost as an extension to their uh, to to their stuff. So I'm uh, I'm curious about about what is the consideration of get GeoPost adapted by other standards or systems. I think I can answer that. Um, um, so as a, a member of the Kronos group and I attend the 3D formats working group, that's the group that's responsible for the GLTF. There has been for about well, one year, a subcommittee on the subject of geospatial GLTF and um, implementing geopose in the geospatial GLTF is the plan. It, it is um, on the roadmap, and it has been approved by the 3D Formats group. Um, so it will be a, um, uh, it's called a, there's an, it's not an extension, it's like, a, it has another name. Um, but yes, there will be a geospatial GLTF, and that went through a very extensive review, and the, um, there's there's no other there's no other candidate in terms of a standard or even a proprietary implementation that does this. 
uh, in an interoperable fashion. Mm -hmm. um, you, you also, um, you asked about USDZ. Uh, the, we don't have direct communications with the, the community, the USDZ community at this time. Um, though what I know about what's going on uh, between the, the communities, there's a, uh, a working group that was even approved today um, to be uh, examining and developing recommendations for um, an alignment between USDZ and GLTF, but that's not our concern. It's just that those are um, converging uh, or will soon be. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So uh, does USD, does it include, um, like what, what does it do when, uh, for, for things that, that require POS information? Do you know? We have a- Yeah, it, it, uh, so yeah. USD um, does not have a, uh, an, a concept of geospatially anchored POS. It is, it's, um, concepts of pose are entirely independent of the location and orientation of the user. It's really about generating the 3D graphics um, in an accelerated fashion that can then be manipulated uh, in real time. So it's about that asymmetric yeah. compression uh, method and then the GLTF is primarily about the transmission of these graphic graphic files. Yeah. But yeah. neither of them contain a priori, uh, an anchor, a, a way to connect. And if you, you look at, we, as we did many, and we looked at like 15 different proprietary systems that do have geospatial anchoring, such as the, I mentioned hexagons um, systems, ESRI systems, cesium is one of the very well, wide, widely used um, solutions for this. They all do a, a, a form of geopose in a proprietary way, which works extremely well when you're only working with assets that are in that platform. The problem is that if you want to export or interact with any assets that are created in another platform, it's not possible because they're not speaking the same geospatial orientation and rotation data model. Mm -hmm. and, and they recognize that and are all, you know, I haven't heard anybody say, no, we can't do that. Um, they've just said, you know, in, in essence, their interests are to keep users in their platform as long as possible. Sure. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But from my and point of view, sorry, sorry, go ahead. just to say that from my point of view is the ability to create a, a GLTF viewer uh, from um, a user perspective. Uh, from an extra uh, perspective so that you can place something and another person receives that GLTF and it, it can only see it where it should be. So you can uh, actually create uh, a scene full of objects that have the uh, geo are positioning, uh, um, are anchored to the real world so that you can create, for example, an entire city worth of 3D models, each position in a different place. And then you can, by just setting GLTF, you have all the information you need. You don't need to create additional elements. Yeah. And then, so, yeah so can you go from any frame of reference to geopose so because there's so there's different types of local frames right so all these slams they have some 
OpenGL has one, I think Vulkan has one and so on and so forth. So mathematically, is, is you can go from any frame to GeoPose, is that true? Yeah, that's the goal of the group, I believe, to be able to do it. And we have different people that have different types of um, ways to represent the same data from robotics, uh, geospatial, the engineers, uh, graphic designers, everybody works with similar information with similar rotation systems but at the end of the day uh, we have to agree on a basic system and convert every other to that one and provide ways to do so for everybody so that everybody can communicate and understand each other gotcha so ignoring the issues with floating point precision for a second does that mean then that the local frame of reference implementation, uh, it could basically use anything to represent the position in the quaternion, like floating point or double or some unique representation. Um, it, it wouldn't matter as long as it's able to convert that to the GeoPose format. Yes, uh, the GeoPose format right now, uh, at least, is a JSON um, specification with uh, basically uh, numbers for latitude, longitude, and yeah, as you mentioned, the issues with the floating point precision, uh, it's something that uh, I understand, but uh, you can use GeoPose to define the origin of an space, and then you can use uh, a vision position system or any other uh, location mechanism to have like millimeter uh, precision, if uh, the um, precision of the uh, numbers that uh, the geo pose system the basically the javascript definition of number has a limit and it doesn't allow you to get a millimeter precision so what you can do is when you need that amount of precision then you switch to a local system or I you can see. use um, markers in the real world to obtain more precision because then you can define the origin of the space or you can say like this specific point is this particular geopose and everything around it is going to be relative to this. Gotcha. One, one related um, aspect of this, which is um, maybe not as obvious and not as initially as useful is that um, the local, the local frame doesn't necessarily have to be um, um, in agreement with with um, an outer frame, uh, which might be geodetically referenced. Uh, if you think of um, uh, a space, well, an example, which which maybe only some people will, will be able to relate to it, is the inside of the TARDIS in the Doctor Who series in, in uh, the UK. When you, when you enter the door, you're in a different space, which has different uh, dimensions and no relationship to the, to the outside world. But right. the transformation as you go through the portal um, is something that you can express with the GeoPose. So you can actually uh, model relationships between reference frames for which there is no consistent um, external integrated frame. Yeah. Right. And also uh, here in Norway, uh, landslides are common. So uh, even GeoPose has a problem when the land moves because of an earthquake or any other case, what happens with all the geoposes if all of them are absolute? So there are uh, problems like that, that you have to think about to realize that they exist, but mm -hmm. uh, at least know that we are thinking about it so that you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so then if my understanding is correct, the local frame then could be anything. So, so an example of a common local frame now would be the OpenXR specification, right? It has some spec for, you know, which direction is X and Y and Z and so on and so forth. Um, so they, they don't actually have, so as long as you're within a system, basically, you don't particularly have to worry about 
geopose. It's quote unquote when you leave the system, right? When you have to interact with other objects or other systems is when this common standard kicks in. That's a precise point. And what you need is the transformation. You, you right. have to know the transformation. Right. If you know the transformation, then it can be uh, modeled by the geo geopose uh, structures. But, but that's the key thing. It's really um, in detail, geopose is keeping track of transformations between two reference frames. Yeah. Right. So, so then when you say that, um, that, uh, that, that you would like Elixir to adopt this um, standard, what exactly you're saying? That you're saying that we should uh, provide, Elixir should provide the transformation to convert from our reference frame to Geopose. Is that what you're asking for? Or I, yeah. Well, we can provide you with the uh, code. Uh, I am working on the sandbox so that we can provide you with code so that you can add that functionality to uh -huh. Elixir and uh -huh. unlock what I call the, the true potential of uh, XR, that it uh -huh. is, okay, you are not working on a local space anymore. You are working around the world. So how do you implement that? For, uh -huh. for it, you need something like yeah. Geopost. And that mm -hmm. is where, here, we already solve a lot of issues for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but I guess more concrete, just to ask Sarita's question at, like, at an even lower level. So in terms of code, um, if Elixir is, wants to be Geopost compliant, what would it take in code? Like, what would that mean? Uh, as I said, do you have a pose class or a yeah. transform class? Then the idea is that you have additional fields, additional methods to, apart from the um, local position, you mm -hmm. have the global position. In, in, well, global might not be the right word, but you understand the uh, geo position. And the geo, outer frame of reference, the ephemeris yeah. object position. Or, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So what you have is like, okay, I have this geo pose. I insert it into this method and I obtain a rotation matrix, like four by four. And then when you apply that uh, transformation to your model view and your, uh, what do you call the camera perspective, you apply that additional um, uh, matrix whenever you need it. And then that's all that you have to do. Hmm. It's just apply that additional. And the, the other way around, if you have a position in the world, in your uh, world uh, that is uh, locally referenced, you get the um, transformation matrix through the method and you obtain the geo pose for that point. Gotcha. I, I believe there are more parameters and it is relative to another point or so th there are a lot of ideas that we have in terms of orientation or in my case, I want to be able to look from one geo pose to another geo pose. How do we do that? How do we make that reference? But that's something that we are still discussing. Wait, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow. What, what do you mean if you want to look from one geo pose to another geo pose? What? The idea that uh, if uh, I, with a geo pose in the um, XR device, want to be able to know if I am looking to a particular object, how do I calculate that? Because it is possible to do it in the local space, but in the geospace, it's difficult to do. So that uh, it is not just positioning objects, but positioning cameras and rotating them to follow other objects. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't, Imagine I... that you have a drone that has to follow uh, an object yeah. in the ground. So yeah. how do you do that? Then uh, my idea is to, in the future, implement a system that allows you to have a geopose that is able to define not just the position of the drone, but the rotation of the drone because it is looking at the track that it is moving. 
that is something that right now we have not implemented. You just have the rotation either in Jopic's role or with Quaternion. But uh, one of the things that uh, you might find that you need sooner rather than later is that, okay, I have my geopose for my device that I am wearing in my head, and I have a geopose of an object next to me. How do I know that I, that I am looking at it? Or like being able to create a target for a camera. I, I believe Husaifa might be able to know why it is useful for uh, graphic programmers. Right, but my question is that if these are absolute coordinates, um, and if they're you know close enough, why can't you just use like regular geometry to figure this out? Well, uh, you can, but uh, then there are issues when uh, you have to track uh, satellites or when you are doing something that it is beyond the scope of a uh, um, local space. Right, I see. So think about uh, tracking that. Yeah, uh, I wanted like to add another possibility, like, for example, where the project that Steve and, uh, and Rob are involved in looking at, um, so you have a data set, let's just say it's a train or it's a car, maybe it's an autonomous vehicle that itself knows its geopose over time. So it's changing. So it, that object is a moving object and it has these geoposes, right? It's leaving this trail of geoposes, think of it that way. But in, if an implementation of an XR device is using the Elixir platform and it's geopose compliant, then it can, quote unquote, see, it translates the relationship that it has with respect to that autonomous vehicle or that drone or that train or, or, or the, that other moving object. So there's this continuous um, uh, knowledge about the exact relative positions. I, I see that Rob has uh, raised his hand. He's working on this exact same thing. So I'm sure he can explain it better than me. <laughs> Go ahead, Rob. Uh, thanks, Christine. Um, I can, but um, my, my comment was actually directed at an earlier question, which is what code is required to support yeah. GeoPose? Yeah, and, and I have a very yeah. simple answer to that which is an import and export function to whatever the native um, representation is within the system. Right. Um, so something that reads geoposes and something that writes geoposes, mm -hmm. or possibly only one of those, that you're able to accept them or you're able to produce them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is the key to providing geopose support. Represent it this concept in whatever way you want, um, but be able to read and write in a standard format. That's that's the nub of what Geopose right. is trying to do. Yeah. Right. I will implement such functions inside the post class so that it already has access, right. direct access right. to that the post. But yeah, the idea is the same. Yeah. So unfortunately, we are running out of time. We can extend by, I can wait for five more minutes. I would like to make sure we have agreement on, you know, what, what should be done, whether we need to do some, yeah. Yeah. So how, or is next steps. Proper. Yeah. So um, it seems to me that right now there is, um, Okay, let me put it this way. You know, what, what would you all like from us, right? How can we help you? How can you help us, I guess, are the two questions uh, to ask. Maybe Christine. So Christine, you, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I think, um, thank you. Yeah, I think the, the key question is for the person or people who are working on the POSE class in Elixir to work with Mikhail and Steve and, and other people in our group to write that import export function. And, right, and but, yeah. So from our point that, of view, at this moment, we don't really need this functionality at this moment, right? But we are very much supportive and would, uh, you know, we'd love to support you all. Um, so 
from yeah. what I can gather, I think it would be if if you uh, would like because the way we use poses is, is similar to OpenXR, right? In fact, it is uh, the way OpenXR uses poses. Um, so if you could help uh, uh, provide an Elixir is open source, right? Anybody can do anything, right? Open an issue, um, uh, push a PR, et cetera, and we can uh, uh, deal with it. So if you would like to do that, I mean, we can definitely support um, GeoPose um, uh, compliance in our the export and import functions in Elixir. So it sounds, yeah. So it sounds like the best way to do this is through GitHub. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I'm on, I'm on that, uh, that repo. I, I watch it, but I don't know that the other people who are involved in GeoPose are also are in that repo. It's, sometimes it's quiet. Sometimes it's very busy. So, um, but uh, sounds like that's the right way to go to, to, um, to proceed is to create the issue and then um, develop a, um, a, a contribution and and put it in there for um, for a pull request. And we could create a, create a uh, GeoPro support issue and and basically a, a proposal I think from us um, if, and then from the Elixir knowledgeable side uh, you could explain how our proposal is good or bad or stupid or um, close but not quite there and go from there, that seems like a good way to interact. Yep, I agree. Yeah, Josefa, Boyan, do you have comments? Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and if we always have Discord as well, right, for more real-time chatting. Uh, so, but yeah, I think it would be really helpful for us to actually look at some code, you know, you, you, um, so you could either just describe it an issue or open an issue and then open a PR uh, and then go from there. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Good next steps. Okay, great. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I saw Ruki was here from Manchester, though they also do a lot of slam work. Uh, but I think he's left. It's been uh, over an hour. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm late for another meeting myself. Yeah. But uh, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk with you. And thank you, Mikhail, for, um, for presenting. And Steve and Rob, thanks for coming along. Thanks, Patel. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Balls thanks in our so court. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. We'll everybody. talk about it on Friday. Bye bye, yeah. bye, -bye now. Bye. bye.